So welcome to this presentation. I am Professor Somyajit Mukherjee. I will be talking about the principle of 1G analog model applied in structural geology and tectonics. This topic is not covered in many of the universities in India and abroad and I find it suitable to discuss today with you on this. So here is our topic. applied to structural geology and tectonics. Let us try to understand what it is first of all and why we go for analog modeling. If you know little bit of structural geology, there are several approaches of studying the deformed rocks. One is one can do field work. typically done for the BSc first year, second year students, the beginners where they document the deformation history of the rock, how many times the rock has been deformed, the planes and lines and their various orientations, etc. And if there is any doubt with the deformation, we want to cross check. So there is another approach of looking at structural geology is through optical microscope or if I put it inside bracket optical microscopy. The deformation that are ambiguous can be cross checked under an optical microscope or even under uh, using a microscope which has a much higher resolution. We can have a third approach and here comes the analog model which is the topic today. And I can think of a fourth approach, let us say the numerical models. I already told you about the field work and its purpose, optical microscopy in structural geology. The purpose of the models in the laboratory or in the computer screen will be to simulate the deformation which is not possible in field work, which is not possible in optical microscopy. Simulation of deformation is possible through numerical models and analog models. What happens in a numerical model? We can have the differential equations suitable to describe a ductile deformation and we can work further and then the software can give us the simulation progressive deformation of the body with time how the body is deforming. On the other hand, the analog model involves no software, it involves soft deformable material. We deformed in a control rate in the laboratory and we see how it is deforming with time. Naturally, the progressive deformation found in analog model and in the numerical model will not be possible to see in field work, will not be possible to do in optical microscopy. Instead, what we see in these two cases is the final product. Only the final product that is deformed rocks, deformation is seen, but how it has happened with time, only these two means will be helpful to us. And as you see analog modeling is today's topic which I am going to discuss today. This analog modeling just now I told you involves, if I write in a very beginner's language, deformation of soft material, what I can call as rock analog at a 
controlled way. This controlled way means we have some machines, some instruments with which we can measure the deformation rate and we have full control on the deformation. It is not that I take a piece of clay and I press with my hand and I say that a fold is produced. In that case, it is not controlled and also it is not well constrained. Whereas in a machine, we can work out with what rate we are compressing the layers. So that is the meaning what I say here as the controlled way. Now, the analog model materials can be various and in fact, it can be any soft deformable material, any soft deformable. So I'm not going to write what they are, but I can speak out the deformable material which is soft can be clay, it can be even Cadbury, even chocolates, peach, it can be bouncing putty, silicon putty, it can be the polydimethyloxane, in short which is called PDMS which is an organic compound with long chain of carbon and hydrogen which is soft and deformable suitable to deform in the laboratory. So you can also experiment with new soft deformable material and if we know the material property which we will see slowly then such material will be useful to run the analog model. The kind of analog model that I am talking here today is all about the ductile deformation. Again, you can look at the deformation of rocks in three ways. The ductile deformation where the rock does not break into two pieces, rather it deforms but there is no rupture. Let us say I take a piece of clay and keep on pulling, what will happen? The clay will not rupture in the initial stage. And it is can be called as a ductile deformation. But if this pulling is prolonged for a very long time, what will happen? At some stage it will snap. So that is a brittle deformation. Another way of looking at brittle deformation is that take a biscuit and break it. So there is a material line of breakage, two pieces separately come out in your two hands. That is a brittle deformation. Any deformation which is in between ductile and brittle, partly ductile, partly brittle, we can call it a brittle ductile deformation. So today in this analog modeling class, I am going to specify, specifically talk about the ductile deformation and what are the principles involved within it. Why not we take the real hard rock for the analog modeling? The answer is the real hard rock will be very difficult to deform. It will require high pressure, high temperature and some specific fluid activity which is not impossible to generate in the lab but it is certainly difficult, it is certainly expensive. Instead of taking a real hard rock, let us a piece of nice and trying to deform, I take a soft deformable material then at a much slower amount of stress I can deform it and then I can make a one to one comparison between the real deformed rock and the laboratory simulation. So that is the purpose and the advantage of the analog modeling where we are using the rock analogs and not the real rocks. You have noted that I wrote the title of this presentation which has involved the words 1G model. As we will see, the models that I am going to describe will be done in the laboratory where the acceleration due to gravity g is same as what is in the nature. This g is the acceleration due to gravity and we know the value is let us say 981 centimeter per second square. In the laboratory experiments, the things that I am going to describe today, this small g value does not change. It is maintained constant. For example, if I do any experiment here, let us say I break it into two pieces. In the normal condition, it is done under 1G condition. So what does it mean that there are analog models where there are 2G, 3G cases? The answer is yes. Sometimes we use a centrifuge model, we rotate the deforming body with a certain speed and it generates the higher g value. So I am not talking about the centrifuge model even. So slowly 
I am specifying what I am going to discuss. Principle of analog model, that is 1G model, that too for the ductile deformation. So under this background, we can proceed. Okay. Now, we have to understand from where the principle is coming. The principle that I am going to write comes from pi theorem, which is there in fluid mechanics. We are not going to see the deduction, how it is coming. As a user, as geoscientist, we will see how to work with the three specific statements of the pi theorem. So this, as I stated, comes from So if you look, go to your library, you will hopefully find some books on the pi theorem uh, available. Now for the geology students for whom primarily I am making this presentation, uh, some elementary ideas of fluid mechanics is required. So let me do that and then I will get into the subject. Very few beginners things. What is a fluid? A fluid is one, a material which flows. And as we know, fluids have no definite shape depending on the container, whatever is the shape of the container, it can attain the shape of the container. These fluids can have different physical properties, different rheological properties. We can have different constitutive equations. Certain fluids follow this relationship, stress is proportional to strain rate. What is sigma here? Sigma is stress. What is stress? If we are forgetting, it is force per unit area. Epsilon is some parameter of strain and epsilon dot means change in strain with change in time. You can write as d epsilon dt, you can also write it as del epsilon del t if you want. And there is a proportional relation for some fluid this is the constitutive equation and we call such fluids as Newtonian viscous fluid. On the other hand, there are a number of fluids where this simple relationship does not hold true. When the relationship does not hold true, some simple proportionality relation is very easy to write down what is called as the power relation as sigma is proportional to epsilon dot to the power n. Since for n equal to 1 for certain fluids the property is not the, the, the equation does not match with the reality so, so we put there n. Through experiments we can find out the value of n or the range of n values. In some books you will find they are writing like this. So here n can be called as a strain exponent, m can be called as a stress exponent. For rocks there are certain range of values for specific rock types. So these fluids can be called as non-Newtonian fluids and of course no doubt n not equal to 1 or I can write here m not equal to 1 because if they were 1 it would have come back to the Newtonian viscous fluid case. And since we have put a power and approximated the equation, we can call them also as power law equation or simply power law. Okay. Now we take a very specific case of the Newtonian viscous fluid and from here we can easily write down mu is a proportionality constant, we can call it the dynamic viscosity or simply the viscosity.
we call it or simply okay if required and indeed sometimes what we do is mu divided by the density of the fluid we call as the kinematic viscosity but we are not going to use it here i just thought of writing down we are not getting into the non newtonian fluid case so so much of specification is made analog model which is 1g model and then we are describing the ductile deformation not only that we are taking the deforming body as newtonian viscous fluid this one i am not at all going into the detail but is possible to get in if required now what this what is the physical significance of this mu the viscosity is also called the internal friction of the fluid we can call this viscosity as internal friction what does it mean let's say on this surface i have put a drop of honey and this honey will have a natural tendency to flow down now there are two resistance that are working honey is internal friction for the honey's viscosity second is the external friction what you have studied in school as simply friction between the honey and the surface okay so internal friction is the internal property of the fluid and we are going to see its use when we discuss the 1g analog modeling principles so we wrote just now the equation for the newtonian viscous fluid we wrote the equation for the non newtonian fluid and i may write down in this connection the rheological equation for the solids which we know stress proportional to strain and so this is for the solid this is for the non newtonian fluid this is for the newtonian fluid and we know from here that stress is equal to we can write young's modulus as the proportionality constant and then strain multiplied just for a comparison between the three properties in one place in this presentation first i will talk about the different principles of analog modeling and after this goes over i will tell you what happens if the principles are not followed if the dynamic scaling is not followed in the uh, experiments which we will discuss slowly okay so one aspect of viscosity is defined and now the second thing which will be required is the concept of reynolds number let's say there is a tube through which a fluid is flowing let's say the fluid has a velocity v let's say the diameter of the tube is d and the fluid which is flowing is having a viscosity mu so you see the word mu is coming the viscosity term is coming here so here the reynolds number is defined as rho vd multiplied divided by mu if we put the and here rho is the density of the fluid that is flowing a single fluid we have considered 
Now, if we put the dens the unit of density, the unit of velocity, the unit of diameter, length, and the unit of viscosity, we will find that Reynolds number turns out to be unitless. And I would request those who are watching this video to do this elementary exercise by your own. These small steps will be very, very important. Not that whatever I am saying, but also little bit you put your hands, put the units, you will find that RE is turning out to be unitless. What is the purpose of having RE? This number is very crucial. If the RE defined in this manner, Reynolds number is less than 1, this means it is a laminar flow. If the Reynolds number lies between 1 to 10, this means it is a transitional type flow. And if the Reynolds number exceeds 10, it is a turbulent flow. Okay. Now, we have to understand what is a laminar flow, very simple slow flow is taking place and the flow lines are mutually parallel. Slow flow is taking place and the each fluid particle is moving along straight lines which are parallel to each other. In case of a turbulent flow, this is not the case, the flow lines will be non-parallel, eddies can form, vortices can develop. That is the case of the turbulent flow regime. And RE within 1 to 10 means it is neither perfectly laminar nor perfectly turbulent. So, some turbulence is generated over here. So, the flow pattern whether it is laminar, transitional or turbulent does not alone depend on density or velocity or the diameter of the tube or the viscosity of the fluid, but a parameter such as this RE. For more rigorous definition of Reynolds number, you can look at books, but this would be sufficient reasonably in our case. So, now we are in a good position to initiate the principles of analog modeling 1G and for the ductile deformation. As per the pi theorem, the number one point here is that there has to be a geometric similarity between prototype, I will tell you what is prototype and the model. Instead of similarity, you can also use the word simultitude. As per pi theorem, the second requirement will be the dynamic similarity between the prototype and the model and the third is called the kinematic similarity has to be established between the prototype and the model. These three are coming from the pi theorem. So, we will start with 1 and then we will go to 2 and 3 and at the end I will tell you what will happen if we do not maintain these similarities. So, bear with me, I will slowly explain. What is the meaning of the word prototype? The geology students who are hearing this lecture first time, this words may be new to you. Prototype means the actual rock that has undergone deformation. Let us say a 30 kilometer multiplied by 5 kilometer terrain has undergone deformation, say Shingmum shear zone anywhere in India or abroad, wherever. What is a model? A small piece of clay that we are deforming in the laboratory to mimic that shear zone, that deformation, some folded terrain, that is the model. So, it is a real rock that has been deformed, that is prototype. Model is the clay material or PDMS which we are deforming in the laboratory. So, this is the meaning of the prototype, that is the meaning of the word model. Now, let us try to understand 
what it means when we say there has to be a geometric similarity. Very simple. Let's say this is your prototype. This is your study area, the prototype. Let's say this is 30 kilometer and this is does not look like 60, but I will make it 60. So let us say this is 60 kilometer A, B, C and D. A, B, C, D is your terrain, the prototype where the length is 60 kilometers, the width is 30 kilometers. Some deformation has taken place which we want to simulate in the laboratory. Now, I cannot have a 60 kilometer long clay layer and 30 kilometer width to run the model in the laboratory. I need certainly a smaller version. So, to do that the geometric similarity has to be maintained. So, what has to be done is that I can take a rectangular piece of clay and I have to choose A, B and B, C length in such a manner that So, this is our prototype and this is the model. Okay. Choose A, B and B, C length in such a way, what is that? A, B by A, B length, A, B by A, B length is equal to B, C length divided by small b c length. So, what it means? So, if I take a b length as 12 centimeter, the b c length you see here it is b c length is half of a b length. So, I will take half of that. So, it will be 6 centimeter. So, now you can see capital a b by small a b is equal to capital b c by small b c has been maintained. Once it is done, this model is geometrically similar with the prototype. That is what we mean. So, one can also write this equation in this manner if you want. It is all the same. So, this was establishing a geometric similarity between the prototype and the model. Try to understand that A B length on which we have no control, nature has created it. B C length we have no control, nature has created it. But we have full control on small A B length and on small B C length, because those are that is a clay layer. I can chop with a knife and I can get a suitable length ratio in this manner. Okay. So, this was about the two dimensional case where the geometric similarity is maintained. So, this can be called as a 2 D case. Just like the 2 D case, we can also have a three dimensional case. Let us say your study area is not just length and width, but there is also a depth involved. Say the geophysicists are talking also about a depth, certain structures in the prototype. Then instead of the rectangle, I have to think of a cuboid. So, let us say this is capital A length, this is capital B length and this is capital C length. So, how to maintain and this is our prototype. Now, in the model what we need to do? We cannot again have kilometer long length width etcetera in the clay layer. So, I need a smaller dimension a, b and c in such a way that this is maintained. We have no control on capital a, b cap and capital c lens, 
whereas we have full control in the laboratory on small a, small b and small c length. We can choose the clay layer accordingly. So if I again give an example in terms of numbers, let us say a length is just to give an idea, let us say 20 kilometer, let us say b length is 10 kilometer, let us say c length is I put 10 kilometer, though not in the diagram, in diagram c is much smaller than b anyway. So this is your b. So how it will, the, the real numbers will look like in the model. I can take this as let us say 20 centimeter, I can take this as 10 centimeter, C I can take as 10 centimeter. So now you can see 20 kilometer by 20 centimeter equal to 10 kilometer by 10 centimeter equal to 10 kilometer by 10 centimeter. So it is maintained. You can take also some other lengths here then also it is possible. Let us say you choose for some reason instead of these numbers, let us say you take 18 centimeter, then naturally you can say B length will be half, you see here 20 and 10, that is half the length. So it will be 9 centimeter and this length C will be 9 centimeter. Okay. Now the question is what length should I take? Should I take a clay layer which is 1 centimeter length A, then it is too small, I cannot observe the deformation. Should I take a very big clay layer, not permitted. In the laboratory there is limited space, let us say table top experiment, on this table we are running the experiment. So reasonably say 18 centimeter is good, 20 centimeter is good, on a table we can place the things. I will not take 200 centimeter, I will not take 1 centimeter. Even after taking 1 centimeter, I can find out geometrically similar B and C values, but then things become so small that the deformation is not visible. Okay. So I have shown you the 2D and 3D cases of geometric similarity. One more smaller issue and easy thing I want to explain that is the angle issue. What is that? Let us say. the prototype is a triangular area. I am just thinking like that, let us say this angle is alpha, this angle is beta, that angle is gamma, this length is A, that length is B and that length is C. Again capital A, capital B and capital C are several kilometer, I cannot have kilometer long clay layer in the laboratory, so I will take centimeter long layer. So I will choose a smaller triangle as model where A, B and C will be maintained. What will be the relation between capital ABC and small ABC? As I told you just now, as per geometric similarity principle, I have to maintain this relationship and I can repeat that capital ABC length I have no control whereas in the laboratory I have full control on small a, small b and small c lengths. What about the angles? That is why I was talking here. This angle has to be same as alpha, do not change the angle, no ratioing is done. This is beta, so this is has to be beta, that angle has to be gamma. Okay. So with lengths we are doing the ratioing but with angles we keep things as it is between the prototype and the model. For example, we were, I was drawing a rectangular study area and then I have also drawn a rectangular model. Did I change the angle? All the angles were here 90 degrees and also in the model they were 90 degrees. So do not do ratioing with the angles, maintain the same angular relationships. So with this, the geometric similitude is over. We are now getting into the second aspect called the dynamic similarity or the dynamic similitude and how to maintain between the prototype and the model. I repeat at the end I will tell you what will happen if I do not maintain the relationship, if I do not maintain these ratios then what disaster is going to happen. In dynamic similarity there are four issues, 
and we will see one by one each of them. What are those issues? Number one, the issue of density. Number two, the issue of viscosity. So that is why I introduced to the geology students what is viscosity. Here you see the term has come. The issue of Reynolds number. That is why I have already defined what is a Reynolds number. And number four, the issue of force. I write forces. Okay. Let us see the dynamic similarity issue starting from the easy ones, density. Say in your study area, it is, is not just one single rock layer, but there are two rock types, quite common sandstone shale alteration, sandstone columnomerate alteration, <coughs> shale mudstone alteration or an igneous intrusion has come. There can be two or more layers of course that can be deformed. Let us say this is my rock type P and this is my rock type Q and this length is let us say I write as capital A. So let us say this length is capital B. Further I write down this length is capital C. So, this particular length is A minus B. So, for no, this is B minus C. So, for the rock P, the thickness is B minus C. For rock Q, the thickness is C and the length, uh, the, rather the width are like that B minus C and C and the length is A. So, this is our prototype and let us look at the model. Here since there are two rock types, I need two soft deformable materials so that I can properly mimic the deformation pattern. <coughs> so, here I will take P dash and Q dash as the two model materials may be clays of different hardnesses. Maybe one is clay, another is polydimethylsiloxane, or maybe one can be octachloropropane, whatever. Now, say this rock P has a density rho P and this has a density rho q. Now, rho p and rho q, how do I find out for the rocks? I can take a piece of a rock and by coming to the laboratory by immersing in water, calculating how much volume of water it is displacing, then weighing the samples, finally we can find out the density values of these two rocks. Now, on this point sometimes argument comes that rocks can have heterogeneity. So, how can a single piece of rock represent the density of the entire layer? So, on this there can be a separate discussion how to find out the representative density in theory and also in practice I may deliver sometime later where this detail is also taken care. For time being think that by some way we know that this rock layer P has a density rho P, the rock layer Q has a density rho Q and we have no control on them nature has created we can find out whereas for take the clear layers that we have taken we can take choose density rho p dash and rho q dash in such a way that a ratio is maintained. What is that ratio? The ratio is rho p by rho q, rho p by rho q for the real rock for the prototype is equal to rho p dash by rho q dash, rho p dash by rho q dash or I can write in this way, this is for the prototype, this ratio is for the model. We have no control on rho p and rho q values, we can at best find out in the real rock, whereas 
we have full freedom of find of choosing the soft deformable material of rho p dash and rho q dash density in such a manner that this is maintained. And from here we can of course write down alternately as this by this equal to that by that. We can write if we require rho p by rho p dash is equal to rho q by rho q dash. Okay. So, what we I demonstrated with the two layers will also be true for more than two layers, three, four layers. Similarly, ratioing can be made. So, that was the issue of density. Now, we are going to see the issue of viscosity and for more than one rock unit how the viscosity will be taken care all and all four under the umbrella of dynamic similarity. Here the approach is very similar to what we did for density. Let us say this rock unit has a viscosity mu p and a viscosity mu q and for the soft deformable material let us say its viscosity is mu p dash and this viscosity is mu q dash. <coughs> okay. Now mu p and mu q nature has created whatever we are observing and somehow we are measuring directly or indirectly. Mu p dash and mu q dash we have full freedom of choosing clay in such a manner that we choose specific magnitudes or ratio of mu p dash and mu q dash. What is the specific way? That specific way is mu p by mu q is equal to has to be equal to mu p dash by mu q dash. So, this one is for the prototype and this one is for the model. For the prototype values, those are for the model values. Again, we can write in a similar manner from here if we want mu p by mu p dash is equal to mu q by mu q dash. So, what we did for two layers, similarly, we can take consider three or four layer or n number of layers if required layered rocks become important in some of the models. For example, the saddle and reef geometry of the fold where there are rocks of different layers. You compress one layer gets more folded another is less folded. In between there is a gap saddle and reef geometry is produced where hydrocarbon might be there. So, finally, all are linked and going towards the applied geological direction. Okay. So, this is what the issue of viscosity and that was the reason I was talking about the viscosity issue. I repeat here that mu p and mu q nature has produced the rocks we can have direct or indirect ways of finding out the viscosities of the rocks. Now, this is bit confusing rocks are so called solid materials. What about the viscosity of the rock? We said viscosity term comes from the Newtonian viscous fluid. Are all rocks Newtonian viscous fluid? That is debated, but one thing is for sure in a very long range of time everything is fluid. Or all materials at very large scale of time so that means I am fluid and the persons who are watching they are also fluid in what way? Let us say here is a piece of rock which is standing. In my lifetime it will be standing like that, but if I were so lucky to live millions or billions of years, I would have seen that this rock due to its own weight has spread like that. Due to its own weight, any so called solid will spread in these directions. What it wants, what is the material's intention? The intention is that the center of gravity over here for this rectangle wants to reach the earth's core. So, this by its own gravitational collapse, this center of gravity comes down little bit. It wants to reach the earth's core, but it can never reach because there is a surface. 
So, what is the future of such a material? Again, spend some more billions of years. This material will flow like that. It's more spreaded. Where is the center of gravity now? The center of gravity is over here. So, the material keeps on spreading infinitely. If you give very, 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 very long time and the center of gravity once comes closer and closer to this surface. So, what is the future? Infinitely long spreaded material and the center of gravity very close to the surface, but not touching the surface. So, in that way, everything is fluid. All so called solids are fluids. Rocks are solids over a short time span. And this, what I have demonstrated, certainly in experiments we cannot do in the laboratory. In my lifetime, I cannot demonstrate that a rock is flowing. But geologists do find out evidence of gravitational spreading or gravitational collapse in terms of the nap structures. This is a gravitational spreading. Due to its own weight, the body is collapsing. What are naps? Overturned folds, maybe recumbent folds, found in collisional origin that has translated for many kilometers. Due to its own weight, the material actually sinks down. And you can look at the naps in detail and the gravitational spreading. Salt domes sometimes undergo gravitational spreading. What the geoscientists have interpreted from the final product in the, through field work or through the geophysical studies. Okay. So, back to the point, all so called solids are basically fluids, fluids of very high viscosity. When the viscosity is very, 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 very high, then the material is practically solid. For example, we wrote stress is proportional to strain rate. And from here we wrote stress is equal to viscosity multiplied by strain rate. Now, if this mu value goes very high, then this equation will approximate to a solid equation. This will approximate to Young's modulus multiplied by strain. So, strain rate is gone. When the mu is very high, we can think this fluid property approximates as a solid property. Where do you see any other evidence of gravitational spreading? It has been said that in old churches in Europe, there are evidences in the glass in the window. The glass is thinner in the top, thicker at the bottom. So that means glass has flown down over last so many hundreds of years. But there is another argument that says that those glasses are manufacturing defect. That is not indicating gravitational spreading. There are always controversies in any healthy scientific uh, community. Okay. So, this was about the viscosity. One question comes to students mind, how do I measure the viscosity of the real rock? How do I find out the viscosity of the real rock? It is behaving like a solid in the laboratory, I can find out the Young's modulus. So, to do that, I would just write down my mail ID over here. Those of you who are watching and want to know the detail, I will send you research papers. This is my mail ID. Or if I write in all caps, send me email and I will share with you how to find out the viscosity of rocks. Those will be indirect methods. This will not be direct methods of finding out. And that those were about the rocks, but what about the model soft material, how to find out their viscosities? We have an instrument called viscometer. It can be found in the chemical engineering or mechanical engineering departments, where you can take the clay material or the PDMS and ask the instrument person to give the value. Within few hours, you can get the value. 
not getting into the detail of the viscometer either. But you can search in internet about the detail of the viscometer where soft deformable material clay, PDMS, bouncing putty etc. can be given and we can find out the viscosity values. So I have finished the density issue and the viscosity issue. Now I am going to the third issue of dynamic similarity that is called the issue of Reynolds number. Let us consider a prototype few kilometers long and few kilometers wide. Let us say twenty kilometer long, ten kilometer wide. Let us say the base is static and I shear this rock has undergone a simple shear or non coaxial shear with some rate, slow rate, let us say 3 millimeter per year. So, if it is a rectangle, if I shear it will become parallelogram. How do I interpret this simple shear direction in the field? That is again it is another subject of how to find out the ductile shear says indicators. Again, if you are interested, I can provide you materials, drop me email or look at structural geology books, shear sense indicators. From there, we can find out this half arrow. We can make out in the field that in the past, in this way the rock has slided. So, we know about it from shear sense indicators. How do I find out the rate of shearing? Again through geochronological studies it is possible to do, again another big subject in itself. The geological shear in the rock is usually at a very low rate, couple of millimeter per year is the usual rate and when we say fast rate of shearing by geochronologic means we have found out it will be several centimeter per year. So I can write here centimeter per year of slip is a fast rate in structural geology. Few centimeter per year and commonly this is usually we find out from the geochronological studies. Okay. But do not think that all geological processes are slow. For example, if there is a landslide, within one second there can be one meter of movement, it is possible. Within one second there can be this much of displacement of the rock. A piece of rock breaks during landslide and falls faster rate. Certainly it is much, much faster than centimeter per year. It is like an invisible rate to a common man's eye, centimeter per year. Only a scientist can decipher through scientific studies. Now, this deformation I want to simulate in the laboratory. First thing I will do is I will maintain a geometric similarity. I will take a clay layer. Let us say this will be 20 centimeter long and 10 centimeter wide. The moment it is done, we say that this model is geometrically similar with the prototype because you see 20 kilometer by 20 centimeter is equal to 10 kilometer by 10 centimeter or in other words 20 kilometer by 10 kilometer is equal to 20 centimeter by 10 centimeter. So, geometric similarity is done. Now, since a rate is given, we are thinking of Reynolds number. We have to find out in this kind of deformation, how much is the Reynolds number in the prototype. So, I can write R E P, remember the formula and that is why we were writing earlier rho V D by mu V Z what is the density of the rock? Let us say we pick up a piece of rock, if not from mantle source, if from the crustal source, let us say 2.4 gram per centimeter cube. The CGS unit or if I convert it into an MKS unit, it will become
okay. So, the Reynolds number we will calculate in this case like this rho is 2.4 multiplied with the velocity 3 millimeter per year. Now, this is not a CGS unit because millimeter and year neither of them are CGS unit. So, I will convert it into CGS unit. I will write down V for that 3 millimeter, but I need to write from here I think. So, I start from here is equal to 2.4 multiplied by 3 millimeter means 3 by 10 centimeter per year. Each year has got 365 days except leap year, but even if I put 366 the result will not vary much. Each day has got 24 hours, each hour has got 60 minutes and each minute has got 60 seconds. So, the V value 3 millimeter per year is this term. D is the diameter. Now, we are not dealing with a with a with a cylindrical uh, container through which a cylindrical medium through which fluid is flowing. Approximately, I will take this representative of the D approximately. So, 10 kilometer I will take as 10 this is in kilometer I want to get back all in CGS. So, multiplied by 10 to the power 6 sorry 10 to the power 5. So, this is now in centimeter 10 into 10 to the power 5. So, what I have taken care so far is that I have taken care rho V and D the remaining is mu. How much is the viscosity of this rock through indirect means let us say we find out the viscosity of this rock is 10 to the power 18 poise and I tell you poise is the CGS unit. So, I will divide since it is divided by mu. So, I will write here multiplied by 10 to the power minus 18. Okay. So, this is a Reynolds number for the prototype which will come out as a extremely small number. We can ca usually ask students to calculate this number, it will come out as a very small number, whatever comes out fine. Now, the idea is that this Reynolds number has to be matched with the model's Reynolds number. This is a requirement, third requirement for the dynamic similarity. To do that, well, we will of course use some mechanical means of shearing in a similar manner, so that similar structures can be reproduced and I can compare them with the prototype. But logically, I cannot generate 3 millimeter per year in the laboratory, which can through a cheap instrument impossible. Even if it is possible, it will be very, very expensive if at all. And secondly, if 3 millimeter per year is the rate of displacement, my experiment will take very, very long time, so many years. Whereas, in a PhD usually within 5 years we have to finish, a master's student's thesis has to be finished within 1 year or let us say 6 months. So, looking at this practical difficulty, we will not try several millimeter per year, we are bound to use a much faster rate, let us say 1 centimeter slip per 5 minutes and this is possible. There can be an instrument for which a geologist will consult an engineer and say that I need one such instrument through which I can shear this clay layer with such a rate. This is possible, it will not be very expensive either. So, we want to check Reynolds number in the model comes out how much is this Reynolds number in the model matching with the Reynolds number in the prototype. If they are matching then the dynamic similarity is maintained. Now, let us look at the rock analog that we are experimenting. If I take 10 to the power 18 poise viscosity that means real rock, I cannot deform at all in the laboratory. As I told you to deform a rock in a ductile regime, we need high pressure, high temperature, certain fluid activity condition 
which is too much, which is too expensive in the laboratory. So, we will take softer material. Let us say its viscosity is 10 to the power 6 poise. What about the density of common clay mineral or PD, uh, PDMS, clay materials or PDMS? The density can be, let us say, it was here 2.4, let us say I take 2.2 gram per centimeter cube. This is possible, maybe 2.4, 2.5, maybe 2.52, etc. is possible. Now I want to calculate the Reynolds number in the model. Again, recall the formula rho Vd divided by mu. So, what I will do? Rho 2.2 gram per centimeter cube, which you can also write at 2200 if you want kg per meter cube. So, it is 2.2. Since I have given one CGS unit over here, I have to give CGS unit for V, D and mu also. V, 1 centimeter per 5 minutes, that means 1 centimeter per 5 into 60 seconds. This 1 centimeter per 5 minutes is equal to so much centimeter per second multiplied by D. I have taken 10 centimeter okay, and then divide by mu 10 to the power 6 is the viscosity of the soft material found through viscometer. Now I will write here multiplied by 10 to the power minus 6. This is not visible I think, so I am just writing here multiplied by 10 to the power minus 6. Okay. So, this Reynolds number in the model usually I ask students to calculate and some number comes out. And then I ask the students compare this number with that, are they similar, are they same and after calculating they find that th there is not at all. Yes, it is very, 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 very small number and it is very, very small number this is smaller than that, much, much smaller than that. So, in terms of symbol, we can write that Reynolds number in the prototype is much, much smaller than the Reynolds number in the model. I would request those who are watching this video to calculate this number, find out and using a calculator also calculate, you will find this is the scenario. So, the Reynolds number matching between the prototype and the model is not working. Now, here is a strange thing that a structural geologist will do. They will wink a eye and say that even though they are very small, but there is dissimilarity, they are practically the same. What does this mean? Suppose I tell you, I will give you 0 0.00000000000001 euro and next day I tell you, I will give you 0 0.00001 euro. You will say both are effectively the same and both are very small. So, in that sense, very, 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 very small and this is very, very small, practically they are the same we cannot do anything better than this. But if you can really match them better the model, no doubt about it, the model is much, much better. But this is what a structural geologist with some amount of funding can maximum achieve. Okay? So, we have looked at density, viscosity and Reynolds number that is done. We are now left with the issue of forces, the fourth and the last aspect of the dynamic similarity between the prototype and the model. I can safely erase because I understand those who are watching can stop and go back and can hear once again whatever is the doubt which is not possible in the class. So, I wait here and look at the students to their eyes and try to understand are they able to follow, are there any questions, etc. So, that situation is not here. We will now straight away see the force issue.
in the last simple shear a single direction of force or stress whatever you say was applied but in geological case there can be more than one directions where compression extension shear etc can work if you look at the plate tectonic regime how plates are behaving deforming or in some smaller scale deformation it's quite possible that there are more than one directions of deformation or stresses for example in this prototype we are talking about this let's say here is a force f1 working in a prototype and here is a force f2 working and they are very large force giant forces gigapascal megapascal plate scale plates are moving so it's a huge force being produced and they are deforming the some rock material we want to simulate this deformation in the laboratory so we took a softer material with much lower viscosity than the real rock maintain the geometric similarity what what do i mean by that i mean to say capital a by b is equal to small a by small b already done now this mega pascal force is not required to deform a soft clay material and it is unrealistic also i am sure the instrument will be very expensive we need a small amount of force to deform a clay material so here we can have a smaller force f1 applied and here a smaller force f2 applied so as you see capital letter and the small letter what does it mean it means that f1 is much more than f1 f2 is much more than f2 this f1 and f2 there are direct and indirect means of knowing in the field through some studies what are the magnitudes of f1 and f2 and what are the directions in which f1 and f2 have acted maybe i show you some example afterward now in the laboratory small f1 and f2 we can manipulate we can change this f1 f2 numbers how using instruments by measurements we can constrain what is going on in our experiment so while we have no control on capital f1 and capital f2 we have at least one thing to do and that is the purpose of this force issue f1 by f2 has to be equal to f1 by f2 in other words we can of course say if you want we can write like that okay so this is what we have to maintain not another point here the angle between f1 and f2 line of action is 90 degree and we don't play with the angles just like geometric similarity case where we don't play with the angles here also we don't play with the angles we can put the pistons which would be compressing this soft clay in a manner that the line of action of force will be perpendicular to each other if they were at an angle theta we also need to give an angle theta between f1 and f2's line of action okay so this is all about two directions of forces if there are three directions same thing will work there be careful this is a force ratio not a stress ratioing there is a difference this is a force ratioing that has been done don't do sigma 1 by sigma 2 equal to sigma 1 by sigma 2 don't try that if you do then you are violating the pi theorem what if there is a single direction of force then this issue does not come at all what if is a single material that is under deformation density ratio issue does not come similarly the viscosity ratioing issue does not come either okay so this is for more than one layer for more than one layer this is for more than one directions of force acting simultaneously in the body and this is for be it a single direction of force or several directions of forces acting on the body this calculation has to be made so with this the issue of dynamic similarity is finished so the third aspect of the analog model 1g for ductile deformation the principal issue which is coming from the pi theorem i am going to describe and it is the kinematic similarity
here more than one event is involved in the deformation and they don't happen simultaneously. What does it mean? Let's say this is a part of a geological time scale. 80 million year back some deformation started in the rock and which finished at 20 million year back. Let's say the deformation D has taken place in the prototype. And another deformation started and has happened from this is 80 to 10, 60, 30, 33, 5, 50 million year back and finished at 20 million year back. And this deformation is let us say D star two deformation has happened in the rock, maybe one is compression, another is shear, maybe compression was throughout there, then in the late phase a shearing started activated, activating in the rock. Or let us say D was a single deformation that has happened, D star was an event, some soft magmatic material which was hot also entered within the deforming rock body, making the rock much more softer effectively. So, how this will be done in the analog modeling experiments. So, in the model naturally we cannot run it for 80 million year to 20 million year. So, we have to think realistically. We can let us say start the experiment 7 am in the morning and we want to finish this experiment at 7 pm at night. That means, it is a 12 hours experiment. And here it is 80 minus 20 is equal to 16, 60 million year long event. Now, how do I choose 7 am to 7 pm? Why not up to 9 pm? The idea is that this D deformation 80 to 20 million year back gave certain manifestations, certain structures. Let us say I am able to generate them starting from 7 am to 7 pm reasonably. So, I will not go further. I will take it as 12 hours time span. Suppose I started at 7 am and finished at look at 10 am itself the deformation is produced. Those structures are found in the model what was there in the prototype. That means then I will instead of taking 12 hours I will reduce this time. Okay. Now, for kinematic similarity we will say that this 60 million year is equivalent to 12 hours. I can write 60 million year is equivalent to 12 hour, 12 hours. If that is the case and here we run a D deformation, I am writing small d so that some tally can be made. Now, when should I start D star in my experiment? Since 60 million year is equivalent to 12 hour, therefore, half of the time, this 12 hours, so 6 hours from 7 am, that means 8 am, 9 am, 10 am, 11 am, 12 noon and 1 pm. This would be the span of acting small d star, a similar event in the model. So, as you see there are more than one event D and D star, they were not throughout simultaneous and we using kinematic similarity decided when should we start small d and when should we start small d star in the experiment. So, in this way the kinematic similarity is maintained. Now, is an exercise for you and it is easy one say instead of 7 pm I change it to 9.30 pm. Then I would ask what should be this time? Very easy one and I would request the listeners to calculate. If you calculate this simple thing, you will be conversant with the kinematic similarity. Several questions will come. We said about capital D and capital D star over here. 
I did not make any diagram. I did not tell you the direction of action of D and D star. Suppose the directions are worked out in the prototype, then in the analog model, those directions have to be maintained in a similar angle. If there were forces acting, we can calculate F1 here and F2 here, then here also F1 is to F2 has to be maintained, just like what I demonstrated in the previous discussion on the dynamic similarity and the force ratioing issues. If there are two layers with different densities of different viscosities, so here also we have to take those two layers with two densities and two viscosities. So with this we have completed the principles and now I am going to set a problem and I will give you some clue how everything works in totality, I mean geometric, dynamic and kinematic similarities working together and how to solve uh, or decide what would be our strategy for the analog model in the laboratory. So the problem will be a combination of geometric similarity, dynamic similarity and kinematic similarity. Say by doing a geological field work, you have understood a prototype like this, that this is 20 kilometer long this is 10 kilometer wide and here this is 2 kilometer so this one would be 8 kilometer here is a rock type capital a here is a rock type capital b they have viscosity let's say mu a is 10 to the power 19 poise mu b is equal to 10 to the power 18 poise which can be found out indirectly. Let us say the density is rho a is equal to 2.8 gram per centimeter cube and the density of rock b not much different let us say 2.62 gram per centimeter cube. Okay. And the total duration of deformation is let us say 100 million, million year up to 20 million year total duration of deformation. Let us say I call it capital D. So, this one is giving us capital D and it is equal to 100 minus 20 is equal to 80 million year. These numbers I am taking arbitrarily whereas in real geological problems these numbers can be found out from the literature study. Okay. Let us say 60 million year back here was intrusion of softer material along the lithological contract. 60 million year back softer material may be some magmatic material C entered and this deformation also continued. So, 60 million is the time when something else happened, a magmatic intrusion has taken place. Now, we want to simulate this in the laboratory. So, this is going to be our model and here I can leave a very simple question to all of you. I am sure you can find out the answer if you want to cross check do write a, an email to me, I can share uh, my thought whether you are doing correctly or incorrectly. Let us say in the model, this distance is 24 centimeter, only one length I am giving and I am asking you a question, then how much should be this much, very easy. The boundary between A and B rock analogs this should be how much, this should be how much and I am giving a clear hint apply geometric similarity. Okay. 
next let us say rho a is equal to 2.7 gram per centimeter cube and I am asking rho b should be taken how much? Apply the density ratioing, it is a part of dynamic similarity and let us say the viscosity of soft material A found through viscometer is mu small a and that is let us say 10 to the power 8 poise, then I am asking you what should be mu b, okay. apply the another aspect of dynamic similarity viscosity ratioing and find out small mu b very easy. Then I am telling you the entire experiment was run for 15 hours. Okay. So, after how many hours from the start should I push by a, an injection through a syringe some soft deformable material C? a softer deformable material at the lithological contact at the small a slash small b contact. And you can find out this through the kinematic similarity study. And if this 15 hours experiment I start like this let us say 7, 10 am and finishes after 15 hours at what time it should be? If it is 7, 10 am time after the start of deformation that is 7, 10 am at what time it should be? You can you will be able to solve it for sure. If you stop my lecture once a while, go back and see the, kinem the kinematic similarity principles that I have described, you will be able to do. I repeat, you can send me the solution by email and I will be happy to discuss with you further. Now one more thing I can add up also. Let us say this material capital C that is pushed has a much lower viscosity I said. Let us say mu C is equal to 10 to the power. 15 poise. If mu c is 10 to the power 15 poise, how much should be mu small c? Again apply the viscosity ratioing. Again if I put a density here, suppose when it was injected at that time the density somehow you come to know rho c was make it lower density than 2.6. Let us say what how much to write? 2.1 gram per centimeter cube, then how much should be rho small c? Again apply the density ratioing. So, if you do this problem, you will be very clear cut how the principles of analog modeling are working. Now, we will add the force directions. So, that all aspects of uh, the similarity issues will be meant will be demonstrated. Let us say when this D deformation was going on, D is all about a compression, decompression. Decompression was going on. And another direct okay, we have to add another deformation then. D. Now I will add up, let us say. 
here there was another compression which is d star compression. Now, d compression acted from 100 million year back to 20 million year back and I am telling that d star compression acted between let us say 30 million year to 20 million year back. So, this is the time of action of d star compression. So, here in this experiment 7 10 a m when the experiment started and the experiment ran for 15 hours at what time d star should be applied from here the compression small d star and here is your capital D compression. So, where to write here is the last question probably is that at what time d star applied d star to be applied on the model when the total duration was 15 hours experiment started at 7 10 am. So, if you do that you are applying the kinematic similarity once again. Let us say the decompression the force that was applied F d is equal to how much to write? Let us say let us say 100 units just like that and here d star compression is only 10 units. So, if here the decompression let us say is 50 units not 50 if it if we, if we said here 100 units. So, let us make it 2 units how much should be the d star. So, when you are watching this presentation I have given so many questions in a flow I would request you listen to one question write down in your copy understand and then again run the presentation and one by one in your copy sequentially you write down the questions. Here I had some constraints so I have gone from this side to that side up and down etcetera, but in your copy you can make it very uh, specified and one by one you can write down those questions. When you do not understand go back to the lecture again listen it once again and you will be able to do. So, with this I am now left with just one final question. What will happen if I do not maintain geometric similarity I do not care about dynamic similarity I am not interested about kinematic similarity I just want to run, run an analog model. What is the outcome why it is going to be a disaster scientific disaster that I am going to explain what if these principles are not followed. In other words what if the dynamic similarity between the model and the prototype this is important if there is no problem why should we do all these things let us try to understand it. Say you are applying a shear or not even a shear it is a body it is a prototype and we have a corresponding model and we have carelessly created the model. So, that capital A by capital B length is not equal to small a by small b length that means, and this model this prototype 
deformed for let's say 30 million years in the nature. So, 30 million year of some deformation and we ran the model let's say for 7 hours. Okay. Now, I am telling you while running the model, we observed something spectacular happening. We found that at this point, while running the model, we found that at this point, some structure produced after certain time and then it got destroyed, something like that. Let us say here some structure formed at 3 hours from the start and got destroyed at 7 hour sorry at 6 hour. So, that means in the prototype also this has happened, but in geological field work we could not understand because the structure got formed and got destroyed. So, there is no evidence left in the field there is also no evidence. So, the model is giving something very unique, some structure produced and that got destroyed which also has lot of relevance in exploration uh, aspect point of view. So, my question will be where in the prototype this has happened? Now, I cannot locate the point because capital A by small b by, by capital B is not equal to small a by small b. Since they are not geometrically similar, I cannot find out geometrically similar point at this place. This is the problem. But if I had maintained a by b equal to a by b, I could have also found out the equivalent position in the real naturally deforming terrain. How to do that? Say, we maintain this relation correctly. And when the structure was produced and getting produced and destroyed, we can easily find out from the model this distance is small m, this distance is small n, like coordinate. We could find out this point has a coordinate m comma n. So, since a by b equal to a by b, what I will expect here to locate the point is that this will be the coordinate m and capital N. What is the relation between capital M and small m etcetera? The relation is let us say capital A divided by small m should be equal to small a by small m and we know this, we know this, we know small m in the laboratory experiments. So, we can locate m coordinate in the field. Similarly, I can apply another geometric similarity how I am getting the confidence because we created the model and the prototype following the geometric similarity. So, I expect everything happening will be geometrically similar between the model and the prototype. So, what would be our next equation I can write down I can write capital B by small by capital N should be equal to small b by small n. Now, in the laboratory experiment I know n value where the structure is produced and destroyed b value is also known capital B is also known from field. So, now what is left is capital N, capital N can also be located. So, once capital M is located, capital N is located therefore, M comma N or the coordinate in the prototype is also located. This is the great advantage of analog model, there are other advantages also which by doing field work we cannot achieve, which by doing optical microscopy we cannot achieve. Okay. Now, with this the main discussion is over. Let me quickly tell you 
analog modeling is more than 100 years old. You can find in Google by searching photograph more than 100 years back, geologist compressing the clay layer and getting folds. It was popularized in 1960s by Hans Ramberg in Uppsala University, what is now known as the Hans Ramberg Tectonic Laboratory, where still these such models are run. Initially, people were skeptic in geoscience. Slowly, it got acceptance. 1980, 85 or 90 onwards, computational facilities increased. So people moved into software deformation simulation. Then free software came. Now name any branch or sub-branch. There are so many free software available. So analog model popularity little bit decreased, but it is still there. Look at the international publications in the journals where you will find still such papers are coming. Then what is the advantage still at this present moment as I am talking on 3rd January 2022? Why should we run analog model? Why should not we use the analytical model? The idea is all models are welcome. Even analytical models through software is welcome. But the point is to learn analytical model, you have to spend long time. You have to learn mathematics. You have to learn handling software. If it is not free, you have to purchase. Whereas in analog model, we can just take deformable soft material, do these very simple things what I described, run the model. You need not be an expert of fluid mechanics. You need not know vector calculus, but still you can simulate things. So both have their advantages and disadvantages. And still today, the oil industry is paying money for running the analog models. So although the popularity of analog model is little bit decreased, but it is still present and we much expect for next hundreds of years, it will be there in structural geology and tectonic modeling. So with this, this part of lecture is over. To tell you the next possible lecture that can be centrifuge model, where not just at a 1G, the modeling is done, but a rotating system where the deformation goes on, high capital G value is produced, so the deformation is intensified. There can be another set of principles which can be discussed. And just like ductile deformation, there can be brittle deformation happening, where also we can look into the what are the principles so that the model and the prototype will be geometrically, dynamically and kinematically similar. Thank you.